we're going to get right into it. We've been in a series. In fact, this is week two of the series, Check Your Source. And if you are here last week, you heard my guy Chris Keyes. He shared a message, uh, laid a foundation for where we're going to be going in this series. And I get to go ahead and build on that with week number two. And so we're going to be talking about God's character a little bit. And so I want you to, if you're taking notes, write this down, and you can also get our notes on the Bible app if you need those. Um, If God is good, we're going to answer some of these questions in week two. If God is good, then why do bad things happen? If God is good, then why do bad things happen? Have you ever asked yourself that? Have you ever had somebody ask you that? I can guarantee you that most of us, if you've served Jesus for any amount of time, that you've had somebody ask you that question. If God is so good, why do bad things happen? And in this series, Check Your Source, it's so important for us as followers of Jesus that we understand that the source, where we get everything, the source, not just a source, but the source is the Word of God. It's the Bible. If your source isn't Scripture, then you can't put confidence in it. But if your source is scripture, you can put your confidence, you can put your faith, you can have an assurance, you can have a knowing. And I believe that each one of us in the season, in the hour, in the culture that we're living in, each one of us needs to have a knowing. We need to have an understanding. We need to have a foundation built of what it is that we believe. My heart for you is, our heart for you is throughout this series, that this helps build on your foundation so that your beliefs are solid, and so that when people ask you to give a reason for your faith, you can actually back it up with scripture, not just ideas from culture or ideas from your friends, but actually from scripture. So I'm gonna get right into it, and here's what I believe. We need to know God's character. How many of you are with me? We need to know what God's character is. And when we're looking at God's character, We look no further than the Bible. I want you to write this down. What does the Bible say about God's character? What does the Bible say about God's character? We're gonna look at four things tonight that I believe that the Bible says about God's character. The first one is this, that God is good. He's only good. He's only good. In fact, in James 1.17, it says, every good and every perfect gift is from above and it comes down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. How many of you are thankful that every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above? That with him there's no variation, there's no shadow of turning, meaning that there's no changing there, there's no, I'm not sure what I'm gonna get one day to the next. Who knows what the mysteries of the Lord might be? No, that I don't know where all of that came from, But if people say, well, no one can know the ways of the Lord. No, we have the Bible to tell us the ways of the Lord. And it tells us that he's only good and that every good and perfect gift comes from him. The second thing is this, that he doesn't change. He doesn't change. He's only good and he doesn't change. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, it says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we can trust that God is good. Why? Because the Bible tells us that every good gift and every perfect gift comes from him. And then we can trust that he doesn't change because the Bible tells us that Jesus doesn't change. In fact, in the Old Testament, God refers to himself when talking to his people and says, hey, I'm the Lord your God. I change not. So we see all throughout scripture, God's God being affiliated, associated, and reflections of his goodness all throughout scripture, even through the life of Jesus, but, but also he talks about how he doesn't change. And so we can trust that God is the same, that he's not gonna change, that we don't have to wonder, and I'm so thankful that we can know the character of our God. In fact, that's where your faith comes in, is by having confidence in the character of God. If you think that bad things come from God, you'll have trouble ever putting confidence or faith in God, because you'll think that some of those bad things are coming from him. It's hard for you to walk in victory as a follower of Jesus, if you believe that things that are actually coming from the enemy are coming from God. You'll never take your authority over the enemy. You'll never live the life that you're called to live if you think that those things are coming from God. No, the Bible gives a a stark contrast between God's works and the works of the enemy. In fact, Jesus said, 
Hey, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy in John 10, 10, but I came to give you life and life to the full. You see all throughout scripture, there's contrast. And if you can do this for the basis of your theology, just resolve this in your heart. God is good. He's only ever good. He's never bad. He's never both. The enemy is bad. If you resolve that in your theology, you'll be ahead of most believers. Not that it's a competition, but you'll be ahead of most believers because most believers want to blame God for things that God has nothing to do with. There are a lot of believers that want to over-spiritualize their sickness, their pain, the reason that they're not experiencing what Jesus came and bought and paid for them to experience. They want to over-spiritualize it and act like God's doing it to teach them a lesson or God's doing it because he, he, he has to do that and he's going to work through it. There's purpose in this pain and God has purpose in this pain. Um, I think when we get beyond like, okay, God did this to teach a lesson, and then we go to, well, there's purpose in this pain. No, God can use everything. He will use everything. In fact, the Bible says what the enemy meant for evil, God will turn for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But don't mistake this, because a half lie is just as poisonous as a full lie. If you think that God wants to bring pain so that he can see his purpose fulfilled in your life, you have a misconception about the character of God. God doesn't do that. He'll take what the enemy meant for evil and he'll turn it for good, but he doesn't do evil to produce anything in your life, to do anything in your life, to help grow you in your life. God's big enough. He doesn't have to do things like that to get your attention, and he doesn't. It's outside of his character. He is love. He is righteous. He is holy. He is just. That is who our God is. The devil is the one who all of the bad things, all of the sickness, all of the disease, everything that you see that's evil, it comes from the evil one, the enemy. And so again, if you can resolve that in your theology, you'll be way ahead of where most believers are. But I wanna get into a little bit tonight, it might feel like a little deeper theological discussion, but I think that's okay because it gives you a foundation. I hope that you came hungry for the word, and here's what I also hope, that you came expecting God to move tonight. I just believe that there's something special on this night. I was doing a prayer walk a little bit earlier, just walking around my neighborhood, just praying and worshiping, and I just sense that God wants to make his goodness real to you he wants to reveal his character to you for those that need healing. He wants to heal your body tonight. I truly believe that. And so we're gonna look all the way back at the beginning because I think it's important to look back at the beginning. And I want you to write down this as point number three. He gave mankind, we see God's character in that he gave mankind a choice or he gave them free will. All the way back at the beginning in Genesis with Adam and Eve, God created everything, right? We all know in the book of Genesis, how many of you are familiar with creation? God created everything and he said it was good, right? He didn't say it was bad or evil. He said it was good. It was all good. Everything God creates is good. Everything that comes from the hand of God is good. And then he created man in his own image and in his likeness. He created man to have relationship with him, to have fellowship with him, to have dominion over everything and rule over everything. And so Adam is walking on the earth, Eve is walking on the earth and they have dominion. They have fellowship with God. They're ruling over everything. And God tells them, hey, you can eat of any tree but just don't eat of that one. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Just don't eat of that one and you'll be good. Everything else is yours. You have rule over it, just stay away from that. And what do they do? The serpent comes, deceives Eve. She tells Adam, hey, we gotta try this. This is gonna be good for us. So he takes a bite and they've done exactly what God told them not to do. They did exactly what God told them not to do. So they sinned, so that's when sin came into the world. A lot of us know that, but sometimes it's good to go back to the beginning of where sin went ahead and entered the world. Sin entered the world through mankind. Let me frame it for you this way. If I gave you the keys to my car, which I'm not going to, but if I did <laughs> give you the keys to my car, and I was like, hey, you're gonna wanna not go over 110 in this thing, because uh, you'll probably wreck it. You're gonna lose control. And you take the keys to my car and you get on 77 
and you go 120 and you run it into the rail and you total the car and then I show up at the scene and you blame me. <laughs> Whose fault is it actually? Whose responsibility is it actually? Isn't it interesting though that with mankind, when it comes to us, Adam sinned and sin and evil entered the world. You wanna know why there's evil in a world that God created if God is good and how can there be evil in this world if God is good and he created everything? You haven't been a part of the world that God created. God created it and it was good and there was no evil. Evil came when Adam sinned. Sin came when Adam sinned. And because of that, all of mankind is born with a sin nature. Isn't it interesting though that even in our lives, sometimes we make decisions that we know are against the will of God and the word of God, and then we get mad at God as if it's his fault. This has been a problem in the church since the beginning of time. And isn't it interesting that we as humans think it's okay as imperfect humans to question a perfect holy God as if he's the one to blame when really we need to just get out a mirror and look in the mirror because a lot of it was us. See, it was our free will and our choice. God gave a choice. He loved so much that he gave a choice and Adam made the wrong choice. What happened as a result? Here, first I wanna read God's original intent for mankind. Again, it was fellowship, I want you to get this, relationship, and for man to rule over the earth. And in Genesis chapter one, verses 26 and 27, it highlights this. It says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds in the sky, and over the livestock and the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. So you see here that God created man to rule and to reign and to have dominion and to have control. So it's just like me giving you my keys. God gave control. Well, if God's in control, how do these bad things happen? God, what? God gave control to Adam. Does this make sense to you? He gave control to Adam. So what happened as a result of Adam's sin? There's always a consequence to sin. And you need an understanding of scripture to know that the natural laws governing the earth today are largely the result of the fall of man, Adam's choice to sin. Now the world lives under a curse, like I mentioned, and we're born with a sin nature. Romans 5.12 says it this way, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Isn't it amazing how the Bible just paints it clear for us. When Adam sinned, sin, where did evil come from? Our free will, our choice, mankind. And before we get down on Adam, let's just look at ourselves for a moment and realize that we've all sinned. Anyways, Adam brought, Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone for everyone sinned. So the consequence of Adam's sin, I want you to get this, was separation from God it was that sin came into the world, and it was that now Satan rules as the God of this world. So why are bad things happening? Why do evil things happen? We live in a fallen world of which the enemy, the devil, is the God of this world. We live in a fallen world, and the enemy is the God of this world because of what Adam did, because of Adam's sin, because of the sin of mankind. I love this. Proverb, again, God gives mankind the, the right to make choices. Man messes it up, blames God for it. I love the book of Proverbs because it's the book of wisdom. In fact, if you've been with us on the weekends, Pastor Mike is in a series on the book of Proverbs, and we've been reading a proverb a day as a church, and we're in Proverbs 3 today, which is great. But in Proverbs 19, once you get there, I'm just going to give you a verse ahead of time, okay? Proverbs 19, verse 3. I love this because it says, people ruin their lives by their own foolishness and then are angry at the Lord. Doesn't that sound like the human condition? Doesn't that sound like what we do? Doesn't that sound like what I just highlighted there? That we want to blame God 
for what was actually us. And we don't have enough of an understanding of where this all started, where sin and evil came into the world enough as followers of Jesus to pinpoint it to the deception of the enemy and the wrong choice of mankind. But the deception of the enemy and the wrong choices of mankind are the source of all evil. Sin is the source of all evil. Where there's sin, there is evil. Where there's sin and wrong choices, there's evil. So you may have asked yourself these questions. Couldn't God change everyone's personality and program them not to sin? If God's, if God's really sovereign, here's the thing, the sovereignty of God gets misconstrued and misconcepted a lot. God's sovereign to his word. He's sovereign to his word. He's gonna stick by his word. He's true, he's just, he's righteous, he's loving. He's gonna stick to his word, but, but couldn't God change everyone's personality and program them not to sin? If he did that, that would mean no free will. That would mean no free will. We no longer have the right to choose. Had God chosen to do this, there'd be no meaningful relationship between him and creation. God made Adam and Eve innocent with the ability to choose good or evil. Because of this, they could respond to his love and obey him or they could disobey him, and they chose to disobey. So here's the thing. God loved us enough to give us free will because he wanted us to choose him, to choose his way, to choose relationship. He so desired relationship that he made mankind in his image for relationship, for fellowship. That's the God we serve. He's a relational God. He wants fellowship. This isn't a religion. It's all about relationship. God created it that way. And so think about this. Wouldn't it take all of the like goodness out? And I can say this as a married person. It would take all of the, the fun, all the goodness out if, if Jillian were forced to love me. If like I forced her to love me, that would be really weird, first of all, and unacceptable. But, but second of all, just it would take all the fun. There's something about knowing that somebody chooses you, that that's what gives the relationship the substance and the depth and the goodness. And that's what God wants from us. He wants us to, to choose him. If he forced us and we were robotic, what would the value of that relationship be? But oh, when we choose him, man, does it please his heart when we choose him. Man, does it just make his heart, his arms are wide open to us and he's just wanting us to choose him. But so many times we go the other way. But if he gave us, if he took away our free will and we were robotic, what would that relationship be? It would be forced. God doesn't want anything forced. He doesn't want to force that on you. He wants you to choose him. He wants you to choose his way. Another thing is, couldn't God stop people? in their wrong and evil actions. Again, if he did that, that would mean no free will. Another question it leads to is where does that end? How far does that go? The part of the problem for us is that we categorize sin. We think like, hey, if God takes care of those big sins and stops those big sins, that'd be good. Like, we need that. We need him to stop the big sins. And we don't acknowledge or recognize the fact that a lot of times it's a series of little sins that are what led to the big sin in the first place. So if we, we just want God to take care of those big ones, and, and it, it sounds really good when you're talking about some of the really, really, really evil things that are going, but here's the thing, God doesn't categorize sin like we do. Sin is sin. Sin's just sin. God doesn't categorize it, we do that. But you, you know, there's some evil things that you're like, man, why can't that just be removed from the earth? Why can't that just, just go somewhere? And, and here's where it becomes difficult. What about when you wanna date that person that isn't saved that you shouldn't date, you know that you shouldn't date, the Bible tells you not to date them, but, but you don't want God to intervene then. What about when you're gonna compromise with your significant other before you're married, you don't want God to, no, not that one, just like the big ones, you know? Yeah. <laughs> what is that? So if sin is sin, then what is that? And I'm not saying that to get down on anybody, 
I'm just saying that to get you thinking. Would you really want God to do that? No, no you probably wouldn't. You probably like that he gave you a free will and, and is allowing you to choose him and to choose to make decisions. And if the decisions you're making you know are poor ones, can I encourage you? Like there's, there's help available, there's grace available for you, not just to cleanse you from your sins, but to empower you to rise above those sins. But here's, the, here's, here's what you need to know. James 4.17 4, says, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it's sin for them. So if God stopped all sin, sin is anything that you know you ought to do, any good that you know you ought to do, that you don't do. That's sin. Bible definition of sin. Is anything you know you ought to do that's good that you then don't do? We probably wouldn't want God to stop all of that, would we? If we're really honest. It'd be great, it'd make our lives easier, but it'd take the choice out of it. Again, it'd take the, the specialness of the relationship, the substance of the relationship with him out of it. Here's another one. Couldn't God judge and remove all those who commit evil or sin? If they do sinful acts, can't God just remove them? If he did that, we'd all be judged and removed. We'd all be gone. We've all sinned before. We've all made wrong choices before. In fact, the Bible says in Romans 3.23, for everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Here's the fourth thing that shows us and reveals to us the character of God that not only did he give us a free will, not only did he give mankind a free will, the ability to choose, mankind chose the wrong thing, sin comes into the world, we all are born with a sin nature, he gave us a second chance. He gave us a second chance. How do we see the character of God revealed? Through Jesus, through our second chance, where everything that Adam had lost Jesus came to restore. Jesus is God's redemption plan. He's God's plan for restoration of everything that Adam lost. Adam lost relationship and fellowship. Jesus came to bridge the relationship back, to bring that relationship back so that all we have to do is accept the free gift of salvation and we can have that relationship restored. Jesus came to restore our dominion back. Jesus came to restore it all back. And so Jesus reveals the plan of God. And I love this in Acts 10, 38. If you look at the life of Jesus, everything that he does, it reflects and it reveals the will of God. You wanna know what the will of God looks like? Look at the life of Jesus. Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. He's God walking all through the gospels. You see God walking. What does God want? What is God's will? You see it demonstrated and done through the life of Jesus. In Acts 10, 38, it says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good. Everybody say, doing good. And healing all who were oppressed by who? The devil. Again, another contrast. Jesus came to do good and to heal all who were oppressed by the devil, by the evil one, by the one whom which evil comes. For God was with him. I love that. Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. It says that in Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on by the world, and received up in glory. That is Jesus. And so it tells us in 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So what does God want to do? What is God's plan through Jesus to go ahead and destroy all of the evil works of the enemy? 
but we have a church that's been confused and so they haven't put their confidence in the character of God. Therefore, they haven't been the ambassadors that they're supposed to be. Did you know that you're supposed to carry the spirit of God, the very power of God, the very nature of God everywhere that you go? You're supposed to carry the God in me mindset that says, I came because of who's in me to go ahead and destroy the works of the enemy. That's why when Jesus came to be our redemption, to be our restorer, to go ahead and reveal the will of God, he's God manifested in the flesh who was the redemption of all of mankind, who died for our sins, who did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves so that we would have a foundation of faith, something to put our faith in, which is the finished work of Jesus. Where Adam fell short, Jesus is the second Adam. He came to restore that relationship so that we could go ahead and call on his name and know that then there's something that happens in our lives that makes us uniquely different from this world. We have the same power that's living on the inside of us that raised Jesus from the dead. We have the same message that Jesus came to give that there's a God in heaven who loves you. There is hope, help, and healing available. That's why the apostle Paul goes and he says, man, I, I'm here to preach Christ and him crucified. Why? Because the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, it changed everything. That's why I'll spend my life proclaiming the only name that ever mattered, the name at which demons tremble, the name at which all of hell shakes, the name that's above every name, where all glory and all honor and all power and all praise should be directed. And that is the name of Jesus. The demons in all of hell know the power that's in that name. I have a question, does the church all of hell recognizes when that name is proclaimed. They know the power that's in it, the power to save, the power to heal, the power to restore, the power to deliver, the power to set free. They know the power that's in that name. The Bible says they tremble. They recognize it. Does the church understand the power that's in the name of Jesus? Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And when he came to destroy the works of the devil, he did a pretty good job of it. Because when he resurrected from that grave, see the death was the sacrifice that he made. The resurrection represented the victory that we get to enforce here on the earth until he comes back over all of the works of the devil. Because he reigns, he's seated at the right hand of the Father, he reigns victorious, we can reign victorious over all of the evil that the enemy tries to bring into our lives. Some of us have gone through life as Christian victims. Some of you have over-spiritualized your suffering. Well, I'm just suffering with this sickness. The Lord gives his toughest battles to his strongest soldiers. Does he really? I, I can't find that. But I can find where there was a sacrifice made to pay for all of it. We have to get back to being a church that knows our Bible, that isn't biblically illiterate to what belongs to us, that we know what actually belongs to us. When you know what belongs to you, it changes everything, but it, because it doesn't just affect your life, it doesn't just change your life. It causes you to change lives around you. The gospel isn't just to you, it's supposed to be through you. Your life being a living testimony of the goodness and the faithfulness and the mercy and the grace and the freedom that's available. Well, I once struggled with this. Well, there's just evil in the world. I've heard people say this. Well, you're just always gonna struggle. People with that struggle always struggle. And they just never, I can't find that anywhere. But I can't find where it says they overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. That can be the temptation that you're facing. That can be the sickness or diagnosis that you've gotten or a close loved one has gotten. That can be the addiction to pornography that you might have. Well, nobody gets over that. Everybody just struggles their whole life. I cannot find that. I cannot find a chain that Jesus didn't break when he defeated hell. I can't find it. I just can't. If you can find it, show it to me. I dare you. Go ahead, look for it. So he redeems us from sin. 
He redeems us from sickness. He redeems us from disease, all of the works of the enemy. In him, there's redemption, there's restoration, there's a second chance to have a relationship with God that God so desires with you. God desires to be close to you. And he wants you to take a step to move close to him. Ball's in your court. He sent his son as the sacrifice for the second chance. All you have to do is believe on him and take a step closer. Again, the dominion that Adam lost, Jesus restored. I wanna give you a couple scriptures for that because I think it's important. A lot of people wanna combat this. In fact, if there's anything that I've preached ever that's gotten the most feedback, the most emails, has caused the most tension, it's this. It's the authority of the believer and the idea that mankind can have dominion through what Jesus did, have authority through what Jesus did. Healing's a close second. So we're gonna talk about both tonight. <laughs> Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And then in Matthew 16, 19, he said, I give you the keys. Remember we talked about the keys? If I gave you my keys and you wrecked the car, whose fault is it? Well, it was obviously your fault, just like it was Adam's fault. But Jesus came and said, hey, I got the keys again. I got the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And here I'm giving you the keys. And whatever you bind on earth, it's going to be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth, it's going to be loosed in heaven. So here are the keys back that Adam lost. Here's the dominion back. Here's the rule back that Adam lost. I'm gonna give it to you. Here it is. The question is, have you taken your authority? Have you taken it? When was the last time you took authority over some of the works of the devil in your life? When was the last time you actually said no to the devil because you identify where it's coming from? See, our faith rides on us knowing the character of God. We, have, we could be, and, and in some cases, you see it around in the church. You even see preachers preaching messages that are completely void of faith but make you feel good staying in the condition that you are and blaming it on God. If we don't know the character of God, we don't have a basis for our faith. We have no foundation. If you don't know the character of God, you'll fail to call out the enemy on what he's trying to do in your life. If you think that pain and sickness and disease come from God, you'll passively allow them in your life instead of actively taking authority over them in, in your life. And what I wanna encourage you with tonight is I want you to actively take authority that Jesus has given because the evil that's in the world, it has nothing to do with God. And I hope that this message inspired faith in you that like God's good and his whole plan of redemption through Jesus was, was for our good, was for our benefit, so that we not only could have an amazing relationship with him, but so that we could walk on this earth free, ruling and reigning as ambassadors and representatives accomplishing the work of God here on the earth, which what is that? Destroy the works of the devil, bring hope, help, and healing to everyone who needs it. Let them know the good news of the gospel, which is if you're sick, you don't have to be sick any longer, which it not only changes the root of their spiritual condition, but it can change everything about their life. The word salvation is the Greek word sozo, which means healing, it means restoration, it means the total package. And I don't wanna stop short and sell myself short, if, if Jesus paid for it, I wanna, I wanna have it in my life. If Jesus paid for it, I wanna, I wanna walk in it. Dr. John Alexander Dowie said this, I'm gonna close with this story. He said, disease is the foul offspring of its father, Satan, and its mother, sin. Disease is the foul offspring of its father, Satan, and its mother, sin. Dr. Dowie helped reintroduce divine healing to the church in his century. In the 1870s, Dr. Dowie was pastoring a church in the suburb of Sydney, Australia. When the bubonic plague struck around 1875, he buried 40 members of his church in less than a month, and four more people from his congregation died and were yet to be buried. It says many others became sick with this awful plague in which there was no cure. 
After visiting many sick members of his flock one day, Dr. Dowie returned home and sat in his study, his arms folded on his desk, his head upon his arms, weeping before God. God, is everybody gonna die? He cried. Are you going to take everybody? Where did this plague come from? Are you the author of this? He was heartsick at the thought of the families that would be torn apart by the plague, the children who would be left to be orphans. Dr. John, John Alexander Dowie later wrote that the words found in Acts 10:38 stood out before him as a light, showing Satan as the defiler and Christ as the healer. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. My tears were wiped away, Dr. Dowie said. My heart was strong. I saw the way of healing and the door there too was open wide. I said, God, help me now to preach the word to all the dying around and tell them how to Satan who defiles and Jesus who delivers, for he is just the same today. He didn't have to wait long, story goes. Within minutes, two young men burst into his study, pleading breathlessly. Oh, come at once, Mary is dying. Dr. Dowie ran down the street after them, not pausing to take his hat. He was furious that Satan should have attacked this innocent young member of his flock. Dr. Dowie entered Mary's room and found her in convulsions. That was one of the symptoms before you would die, is you would go into convulsions. Her medical doctor had given up on her and was prepared, prepared to leave. He turned to Dr. Dowie and remarked, Sir, are not God's ways mysterious? The revelation Dr. Dowie had, had just received from the word was burning in his heart. God's way, he thundered. How dare you call that God's way? No, sir, that's the devil's work. He challenged the physician who was a member of his congregation. Can you pray the prayer of faith that heals the sick? The doctor replied, you are much too excited, sir. Tis best to say God's will be done. And he left, excited. The word was quite inadequate. For I was almost frenzied, he said with the divinely imparted anger and hatred of that foul destroyer disease, which was Satan's doing and Satan's will. It's not so, I exclaimed. No will of God sends such cruelty. And I shall never say God's will be done to Satan's works, which God's own son came to destroy. And this is one of them. Oh, how the word of God was burning in my heart. Furious at Satan's work, Dr. Dowie then prayed the prayer of faith for Mary and the girl's convulsions immediately ceased. And she fell into such a deep sleep, so much so that her mother worried that she had died. She isn't dead, the triumphant Dr. Dowie assured them. And after several minutes, Dr. Dowie awakened Mary. She turned to her mother and exclaimed, Mother, I feel so well. Dr. Dowie quietly thanked God and then went into the next room where Mary's brother and sister lay with the same plague. After prayer, they too were completely healed. From that day on, Dr. John Alexander Dowie ministered to his flock on divine healing and continued to pray for their healing. And because of his belief in divine healing, he never lost another one of his church members to the plague. I don't know about you, but this story, it stirs something in my spirit. I listened to it about four or five times on audio this afternoon, and it stirs something in me that if we as a generation don't carry the torch of faith, then faith might be lost in the next generation. But I believe that God is raising up a generation who will say, I know the works of the enemy, and I know the works of my God, and my God is a healer, and if Jesus came and went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil, then guess what? I will do the same. I will stand on his word. I will build myself up in my faith so that when discouragements come, when doubts come, I won't be defeated and I won't quit. I'll stand tall in the midst of adversity, in the midst of culture, in the midst of diagnoses. I will say greater is he who is in me than he that is in this world because this is the work of our God. This is the work that 
what he's called us to do. He's called us to bring life and light and hope and healing and restoration. And I wonder how many tonight say, hey, I'm going to be one of those people. I'm going to be one of those people who build up my faith, who walk in all that God has for me and help encourage others, help lift others up to do the same. We can no longer be a dormant church, a complacent church, an apathetic church. We've got to be an active church. We've got to be ready to hit the ground running. I want to be the type of believer, the type of faith person that when my feet hit the floor, the devil says, oh no, he's up. I want to be the type that when I walk into the worst of circumstances, that I know my God's the healer and I'm not shaken. And when I walk in, peace walks in. When I walk in, hope walks in. When I walk in, confidence walks in. Doesn't mean that I'm not aware of the problem. It just means I'm more aware of the promise and the one who promised and his character and his track record is he's always faithful, he's never failed, and he won't start now.